Welcome to the show, everyone. Well, if I could see you, I would have you raise your hand if you knew the term white privilege. And I would ask that for a reason, because my that's the subject my guest is going to talk about. So I'm happy to welcome back to the show my friend, Dr. Karen Bondar. Hey, Nance. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me back. Oh, for sure. Now, tell, for those people who like been living in a bubble, mm-hmm. explain what white privilege is. Yeah. So, so white privilege is almost exists in many uh, of us in our population without us even really realizing it. And so it isn't something that people have to be afraid of or, or shy away from this term. Um, if you haven't been aware of it yet, that's okay. Um, but the, the white privilege is essentially, if you are a Caucasian person, if you look from the outside that you, you know, you have white skin, um, the world is an easier, more welcoming place for you. And it's hard for those of us that look like that to t- completely empathize with others who don't look like this, who don't receive the same automatic treatments that we do. So even something as simple as going into a store, a grocery store, um, a, you know, a hardware store, anything that you might need for your family, you know, as a white person, we enjoy being able to walk into that store without any, um, you know, without any issue. It is not the same for people of color. People of color or other visible minorities may actually receive some kind of discriminatory discriminatory treatment, mm. even in those day to day situations. And because those of us who have white skin can can get through our lives and be blissfully unaware that that same ease of of movement through one's day to day life is not the same for others. And so, you know, the time has come in in this world. I mean, certainly the last several years, last two years because of the pandemic have been huge in terms of showcasing how divided our population is, Um, but also it is also done, a climate change is also a huge uh, way to visualize how white privilege operates or what the effects of it are across the globe. We have this notion of environmental racism that um, that is essentially the concept of those folks who are experiencing the most drastic impacts of climate change are those folks that are people in poor nations, people of colors, visible minorities. Um, and so we have to look at how all of these things are intimately packaged together in the same thought processes, in the same approaches that we have. And it and it's, you know, and it's not really about white people having to say, hey, I'm sorry that I'm white or something like that. Uh, that is not what we're being asked to do. What we're being asked to do is respect and empathize and understand that our lives are easier in a multitude of ways. That, that folks of visible minorities just don't have that ease to, to go through their lives with. Right. It's kind of interesting because I think also that when people do become aware of it, they tend to maybe put on blinders because if they don't see it, they don't have to deal with it, right? That's it. And, you know, in today's world, and especially in our pandemic world, where it's been so easy for us to just become, you know, comment jockeys sitting on our couches and being in this isolation, being able to, um, to, you know, not see each other and not understand what each other's experiences are like. Yeah, I think if anything, there are ways that the pandemic has exposed this right. issue, but also exacerbated it to a certain extent. We're all in, in crisis mode a little bit right now just because our lives have been so thoroughly disrupted by the pandemic. Um, However, those of us that have the opportunity to exist in a primarily uh, Caucasian world, um, we're doing better than folks that haven't got our, you know, our look, if you you will. And so even, you know, in our bountiful life that we live in Canada, 
Um, we still have these issues here and we should not, yeah, as you said, shy away from them. We, we need to talk about them, get them out to the forefront. People are not, um, you know, people are frustrated because we have all of these issues that are happening at the same time. You know, we have the climate summit that's happening where we're saying the world isn't fair and we have, uh, you know, the billionaires that are on the other hand, all, you know, competing in a space race. Like we, we actually have such a stark visualization mm-hmm. of this phenomenon right now. Bezos, Musk, uh, Branson, there they all are, you know, and, and it's just in a way it's exciting and fabulous and wonderful that we have this ability and this technology, but also we do have to take a step back and say, okay, if we have all this money, is this really the best way to be spending it when so many people in the world are suffering to just get those day-to-day things? Yeah. I have a friend who's First Nations, as you know, and he said when he goes into a store where there's a security, they will follow him around. Yeah. That has never happened to me at any time in my life. And it's those little things that really make up our white privilege that, you know, and the awareness is key. Awareness is really key. Even, you know, um, when the for, when the Black Lives Matter movement um, first started gaining a lot of ground um, after the death of George Floyd, there was also a lot of spillover into my community, into the academic community, that the academic community is actually quite racist and racialized as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and I learned from colleagues of mine, even simple things like when you split up groups, lab groups, for example, into partnerships, um, have a look at how those are breaking down by those visible minority barriers. Just make sure that you are um, aware and cognizant of where things like that might be occurring in your life. And, and you can take really simple steps to, to help. You're not gonna solve the problem, but I don't think anybody's necessarily looking to solve it. Uh, but we can do easy things that help people to feel more welcome in the same space that we're already in. Yeah, for sure. You know, I remember years ago, and this was quite interesting, an experiment done on the Oprah show. Oh, yeah. Everybody that had blue eyes was put separate like this side. Everybody that didn't was put over here. The people that didn't wore, had to put a collar on. Oh, wow. Okay. Right, like a some kind of weird collar. And the, the people, the blue-eyed people were given snacks and coffee. This other group wasn't. So there's a lot of grumbling and stuff because nobody knew what was going on. The blue-eyed people didn't know what was going on with from the, you know, uh, neither did the, the brown-eyed people, okay? Yeah. It was an experiment to see. These people, blue-eyed, didn't realize that they were treated, being treated special just because they were blue eyes, right? They had blue eyes, you know? And that's the thing that we don't recognize always, right? Well, exactly. And, you know, experiments, I, I went through um, some training to become a, a psychotherapist a few years ago. And one of the, the studies that we looked at um, was a study that took place uh, earlier in the 19th century in a university setting um, where they took a, members of a specific, um, not sorority, a fraternity. Right. And these were all individual students who knew each other and they all knew they were going into an experimental setting to look at the impacts of treatment based on randomness. So, you know, randomly half the group was selected to be the have nots. And then the other half of the group was selected to be the haves Mm. and to really create a deliberate caste system. And without, you know, I I don't recall all of the details of it, but the study itself had to be stopped after a week or or two, I believe, because those that were in the discriminated against group were actually breaking down. Um, And and it's, you know, there's so much that we have to learn from scenarios like that, Mm -hmm. where, you know, we aren't meant to necessarily treat each other that way. And as a biologist, I'm always sort of thinking about the evolutionary adaptations that we um, encounter to, to either get ahead or get others ahead. And it's, it's really part of our basic biological machinery. And I, I find it fascinating. Yeah. I I just thinking about like, um, I can't really relate being, you know, uh, with somebody who, who doesn't have white skin, you know, uh, but I remember as a kid, like my younger sister, blue eyed, very, very fair skin. I was much darker. Like, as a matter of fact, my brother-in-law used to call me this little black baby because oh. I was really dark, the darker eyes, dark hair. And I used to feel dirty compared to my sister. Now, I don't know where this came from, you know, 
but it was an actual feeling. And I used to think, well, why couldn't I have those nice blue eyes and, and nice white skin? It's just a strange thing when I think about it now, right? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, you hear about things like that, that are just, you know, this part of existence. I mean, I, I know, again, as a biologist, I have several friends in the birding community, for example, and there's a large black birding community. And instead of looking at birds, one of the first things that black birders have to do is watch out for others that think that they're in the woods doing no good or, or police or security that might come and actually come and try to investigate what they're doing. They look like suspects suddenly. And this has become a really, you know, big phenomenon in the birding community. And I'm glad that it's being called out um, because imagine just simply trying to do your field work. Imagine simply trying to look at birds right. and, and, you know, and being racialized and having that experience, you know, just, you know, just being discriminated for right, that. Yeah. Doesn't seem fair. Well, it's not fair. It isn't fair. Like, yeah. Now here in Chilliwack, there has been great strides to uh, be an all-inclusive society. Um, but does that include the First Nations people? Like you know, I haven't seen that. Yeah. I haven't seen where they where we were trying to include them and everything. We just we still have those same prejudices. Well, I, I like to think that I don't, but you know, but I see it though, and I and I think why weren't they included in that? Yeah. And I, I think actually, you know, my life's work and I know the life life's work of many people is really looking to indigenize, uh, first of all, our university curriculum, but our, our lives. Um, I mean, my specific area will be in that um, curriculum development. But yeah, I mean, as a as in understanding what I know and what I've learned about the natural world, what I've learned is that humans were living in harmony with the natural world nice. before the accumulation of wealth, before the accumulation of, you know, of, of, of haves and have nots. And the indigenous folks of the world are the ones that we need to be looking to, to understand how it is that they were able to live with out garbage without creating creating poisonous um you know without without killing the planet essentially um and so yeah i do think that we have a lot of work to do in chilliwack we certainly have um a long way to go mm -hmm. uh, but on the other hand of that i will say that i am so proud that we see so much more inclusion in our community of course absolutely and, you know, even in the past few years, um, creating, you know, safe spaces for racialized folks, for uh, folks that have been marginalized in any way, including based on their sexuality. And Chilliwack has traditionally been, um, you know, has fallen behind, I guess you could say, in, in terms of having a little more traditional viewpoints. Um, and I'm, I'm very happy to be part of the, the movement of change in our community to, to really let folks know that, hey, actually, <laughs> we are diverse out here. We're incredibly diverse and welcoming. And there's a lot of people in our community that um, are looking to learn and to grow mm -hmm. and to understand steps that we could take that would be helpful for people. Um, yeah. And, and I'm glad we have resources and communities and committees and all kinds of people that are dedicated to that. That's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to learn. I'm trying to educate myself, you know, see what I can do. Uh, uh, I mean, I fortunately have this platform, which which is one yeah. way that I can contribute, right? But but also on the day to day life, I I, I want to be aware if somebody if I'm in the store and this person beside me is not being served as quickly as I am, because I would like to bring that to the owner's attention. Correct. Yes, right? and that I think that is absolutely something that we, you know, as as folks that are not being marginalized because of our skin color, that is absolutely something we can do. We can call it out and we don't have to necessarily be angry or be no. um, rude. We can simply um, help out when we see that there's somebody that's that's receiving discrimination. Um, yeah. It's easy to do. And it, 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 you know, we've gone past the days of being that quiet bystander that doesn't really say anything or do anything. We actually are, are called out now and it's no longer okay to simply stand by and let that kind of thing take place. Um, it's up to, that's, you know, that's our role now as, as citizens and as, you know, good citizens, I would say, is to, is to make sure that all of our citizens feel as though they belong here yeah and we'd be more unified right 
Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, it, I guess that's one of the things I love so much about just nature and biology is that, you know, everything is different, but everything works and it's there. <laughs> Nobody says, hey, that's a new color of, of flower. That's not allowed. You know, <laughs> nature just works however it's going to work. And so do humans based on, uh, you know, a lot of factors, including where we live. I mean, race is a construct that we've created inside of our heads. Right. There's one race, the human race, uh, homo sapiens, and that's what we all are. Um, and any, you know, any visual that differences that we can see that we have loosely termed racialized differences, that's uh, an entirely created concept. No other animal species has that. Right, for sure. Um, because I have a few uh, First Nations friends, that some of the things I've learned has really um, made it made an impact on me. Like the, the fact that they that I hear that they were there to take care of the earth, mm. not to own it. Yeah, right? yes, that phenomenally different perspective of how can I take care and be taken care of versus. How can I accumulate and have, 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 have yeah. whilst making sure others around me, well, who cares about the others around me? <laughs> That's the Western philosophy that has led to climate, you know, the emergency that we find ourselves in. It, it, it's just on a fundamental level. It's greed versus not greed. <laughs> yeah. And I'm one of these people, I'm very territorial, you know? I okay. Really, <laughs> I really am. Like I, I, I when I lived in my, my house, I had to have fences all around me. Oh, okay. I didn't want my, my neighbor to be able to just walk on my lawn. I, I don't know where that came from. Well, maybe a large family. And we, and I had oh, right. Space. You didn't have any privacy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's much space in the bed. You know, we slept like seven or eight in the bed, right? So, okay. Yeah. You know, or share the drawer or, or whatever. And it's like, and I, and, it, and at the same time, like I have no problem giving anything that I have to anybody, you know, but I don't want them to just take, I want them to ask. And then it makes me feel better if they ask. And then, yes, of course you can. You know? Absolutely. And you know, it's interesting. It's so neat that you're aware of how your personal lived experience has contributed to how you're, you know, impacted by things like that. And I, I really would invite, you know, all the listeners and anyone to, to do that same thing, which is really consider how your lived experience contributes to the reactions and to the way that you act in situations like this. And, yeah. and if you can consider if your lived experience was different, what might you do differently? Absolutely. And I think, you know, how much I love sharing stuff. Yeah. I mean, that's the most, oh my gosh, you feed my family every week. <laughs> <laughs> that's the most fun thing ever. Cause it feels good. It does the other person good. Yes. So it's, it's a win-win in both situations, you know, yet when it comes to, and I think for most people, when it comes to the earth, when it comes to the property, we are not, even the most giving person is often not so giving when it comes to that part. The personal house. stuff. Yeah. I see what you mean. I guess, you know, in a perfect world, we would want all folks to have the initial starting point be the same. Right. I remember but just before we end up, I'll, I'll tell you this, this other visualization I saw once, which was so compelling and I've never forgotten it. Mm -hmm. um, and it was, it was a visualization to simply show that we're all bringing different levels of lived experiences to the table. So there was all these kids at the, at a starting line, you know, to a sprinting race or something. And so they said, okay, if, uh, you know, if you have white skin, take 10 steps forward. If you have, you know, X, Y, and Z, take two steps forward or whatever the case may be. And basically at the end of all of these parameters, uh, there were some kids that were already across the finish line. And there were some kids who hadn't even started yet. And it was a really compelling way to show that just because all the kids show up on day one of school does not mean that all kids are showing up with the same experiences and the same, you know, tools to handle what they're seeing in that classroom. And that same um, perspective can and should be taken by all of us when we're going about our day-to-day -day activities, getting groceries, going to work, um, you know, dealing with our own children and, and, you know, and things like that are really being mindful of, of what privileges and not privileges we've received and how that's informing the way that we face the world. Absolutely. Well, this is a fabulous discussion. You know, somebody suggested to me that, um, just today actually, that it's too bad we didn't have somebody on the opposing side 
Hmm. You know, because that's in a way almost like um, like debating, you know, somebody that's like who, who doesn't realize that or doesn't believe that there is a white privilege, you know, and yeah. it, it, you so that you get both perspectives. But that's uh, a tricky one for me, Nance. I, I totally hear what you're saying. And especially as a journalist and someone who interviews, I can see, you know, I teach my science communication students, you know, you get your scientists to interview, but then you get an opposing or somebody who's outside to give you a little bit more of a legit right. check up on that. Um, but I find that when I'm going, there's hate and there's not hate. Hmm. I don't really need to hear from that perspective. Right. I don't want the hate. I just want to go with the not hate. And I don't really think I need to invite hate to the table, if that makes sense. Uh, That's absolutely. kind of the way I think about it. Yeah. Well, it was just suggested to me that something I hadn't thought of, you know, but uh, I thought, well, if somebody responds to this in a negative way, then I would welcome yeah. them onto the show. I'm like, okay, come on, bring on your point of view. Let's have it that way. But again, not in a hateful manner because I don't do hate. Exactly. Exactly. And, you know, I think that a lot of people may get called out or may get feel like they have been called out for reasons that they didn't understand. Right. And that's where people get their backs up because yeah. they don't think anybody necessarily wants to consider themselves a racist. Um, and so if somebody suddenly says something like, hey, that's really racist, you know, you can get your back up and feel very embarrassed or very um, unsure. Um, the best way forward is to be open, to learn, to be willing to learn, to be willing to listen to where um, to where you've misstepped based on your lived experience. It's not your fault either. Right. We all just need to go through this together with compassion, with a real open mind to what others have been through. And we're just trying to bring awareness. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Absolutely. Once you're aware, yeah. then you can't deny not knowing. <laughs> Bam. <laughs> it's always such a pleasure to talk to you, Nancy. You know, I love having you on the show. Just, <laughs> say, just hang on while I say goodbye to everybody. Uh, right. yes, everybody. I hope that what Karen had to say, or Dr. Karen Bondar, I love saying that, and I have a friend who's a doctor. Um, I hope that had some impact. And remember, it's not about shaming anybody. Yeah, it's yeah. just about bringing awareness in, in, a, in, in a positive way that reflects for the goodness for everybody. Agreed. Right? Yeah. So Absolutely. thanks for watching and I uh, hope to see you again and peace out, everyone. Bye. A sense of community to the wax a place to be A sense of community where you're free Rolling through the mountains, rolling through the valley, rolling through paradise with me. It's multicultural, you're sure to see it all. Chilliwack's the place to be, you'll see. Come party in the park, go dancing after dark. Chilliwack's the place to be, you'll see.